But now we're going to be talking about how to manipulate uh, these surgery uh, descriptions that we've been getting. Right? So we know that every three manifold admits a surgery description. So the question is, how do we know if two surgery descriptions are the same? Right? So Kirby calculus um, basically helps us manipulate these surgery descriptions so we can see if they're the same or not, right? Uh, these moves were, um, uh, were well known at first, uh, but, but the fact that these things are enough that we need to determine if two things are the same, uh, th this is due to, uh, to Kirby. Um, let's go through the moves real quick. Uh, the first move, uh, K1, given the frame link, we can always just add or delete an unlinked plus or minus one frame unlinked. And this isn't actually that complicated. So the idea is that if I had a link, um, I can add on, you know, plus or minus frame unlinked. And the reason why this works is that this is really just adding on a uh, infinity surgery knot, which is just, you know, it's just trivial gluing here, right? Uh, and then plus doing a Rolfson twist. Left, right, Rolfson twist, right? So this is the reason why I did, this works. So that move is, is pretty straightforward. Second move, we're gonna think about a little bit more. Given two integer frame components, L1 and L2 of a frame leak, uh, we can slide one component over the other. So how does this work? Well, let's say that, uh, you know, K2, this, this is the neighborhood of K2, by the way. This is, uh, you should think of this as being the neighborhood of K2. And K2 has some sort of framing, which I'll just draw in a picture sort of like this. Uh, and I do the framing like this just to keep it simple. So the idea is that you know if I glue a little bit of little band here uh, from K one onto this boundary right here. I can isotope K1 along this band, right? And then we can look at what happens when I try to isotope it through the actual surgery torus. So in the surgery torus, so this is the, the surgery torus that we're, we're gluing in. Uh, this orange curve, we know bounds a disc. So it's really the same as this curve here. And the small blue arc right here is just some arc right here. And because this guy bounds a disc, we can sort of isotope this blue arc to the green arc, which is the opposite, right? Just by just you know, isotoping to the disc. So what that means is that we can replace this K1 knot with the knot that goes here and then just follows around the framing all the way around. And that's what sliding uh, one knot over the other looks like. So in a more diagrammatic form, uh, it would look something like this. where we sort of slide it in along and we do some framing stuff. <laughs> All right. Now, of course, doing this move is not going to uh, leave the, the framings unchanged. So we got to figure out how the, the framing should change. So let's say that, uh, <clears throat> that N1 and N2 are the framings of the components L1 and L2. 
And let's look at uh, this picture. And let's uh, slide by gluing along this band, L1 onto L2. So first of all, what would the new knot look like? Uh, let's do that. And yeah, we'll do that also in blue. So the new knot is going to, uh, actually, let's do this on the inside, on the outside, I mean. The new knot is just going to go along the outside here, like this. Um, got to do some framing stuff. Some point in here has to do some like framing things, right? And then slide back, and then follow along like this. All right, and this is going to be in two times if we move it around there, right? So now let's look at what happens to the framing curve for the for the knot. So the framing curve. Um, well, at first, you know, at some point it has to do, you know, some, whatever the framing is for L1. So this is the, the N1 framing. And it's gonna go along this curve. And then over here where it loops, it's kind of sort of stays to the outside is the way I like to think of it. And then it just keeps following along until it gets back. And then it just follows on the, on the outside. All right, so then we can compute what this framing should be by taking the light blue and the dark blue and computing the linking number. But there's an orientation issue here that we have to settle. And so what we want to do is because you know you know this band we glued here, we could actually put in a twisted band. It would like this also, and it would do like the opposite thing, right? So we want to assume that uh, when we did this slide, that everything was oriented so that uh, let's write it down. We want to orient L one and L two so that. They match an induced orientation on on the band. So in this case, if you orient it the first knot this way, you have to orient the other knot the other way. So we have to go this way along this knot, right? Okay. So now with these calculations, <laughs> with this total orientation, I should say, uh, if you go through and see uh, how we get new linking, uh, well, of course we have, let's say N1 prime, we get some uh, linking just from the framing of L1. So we get N1 in there, and we get some linking from the framing of, of L2. But then we get some linking in here, this part right in here, which comes from the linking number between L1 and L2. And if you orient it the way uh, we've chosen, it's going to end up being twice the linking number between K1 and K2. So that's how we get the new framing uh, for the for N1. Now the second link component, L2, well that really didn't change at all. So that that new that guy is just a, just the same. That didn't change. So this is how you do uh, the, the second curve move, which is the, the handle slide.
And of course, this really is, in the end of the day, it's just isotopy, which is why this is to give the same manifold in the end. So any questions so far? So as we said before, uh, the feed manifold given by a frame link is invariant under K1 and K2. Uh, but more importantly, if I take uh, two integral surgical descriptions of an oriented uh, closed three manifold M, they're always related by K1 and K2 moves. So it turns out this is really all you need, right? However, there are some uh, other moves that we're going to talk about, which are just sort of uh, sort of shortcuts using these K1 and K2 moves that are often very useful when doing Kirby calculus. Uh, the first of these moves is what we call a blow down or a blow up. This is a long guy here. So if we have a, uh, a plus or minus one, these are the key, the key things here. If we have a plus or minus one framed on that component of a frame link that geometrically intersects uh, all the other components at most once. And we can move this, this component away from the link uh, by just changing the framings of all the things that we linked with by one. And we're going to draw an example of what this means. And this is what we call a blow down, what I just described. And the opposite of this is what we call a blow up. So let's look at an example of what I mean by this. So here's a nice example. So you can see here that we have a nice, you know, undotted component right there, right? It's frame plus one. And we're assuming that these guys, I mean, I'm not drawing the rest of the link, but we're assuming that these guys here are actually distinct components. That's sort of the idea here, all right? And so what we do, is basically we're going to uh, do a handle slide along this band. In the case that it's plus one, we would do the opposite band in the case where it was uh, minus one. And we can do this one at a time. And what these bands are going to end up doing, these handle slides, is going to end up taking this guy and when you compute it all the way over, it's going to like loop all the way around here, completely unlinked, like this, and then come right back down, like this. That's what the new guy looks like. And of course, we can do this one at a time, and eventually we'll get the, uh, the unknotted component all by itself. So in the end of the day, what it looks like is this picture. This guy stays plus one. And because we're, we're not sliding the unknot, we're sliding everything else. And these guys should all change. In this case, they'll all change down by one. So there'd be minus one, zero, and then minus four. And even though this is not part of the, the blow down move, but now that we have this unknotted, um, plus one frame, I'm not, yeah. I'm linked, plus one frame, I'm not, we can use a K1 and just get rid of it, right?
All right, so the next move, uh, which is not given a name by Sibeliev, but it's the one defined by this uh, proposition. So if we have a framed link uh, with a zero frame unknotted component, which we're gonna denote as L0, uh, which bounds a disk, which intersects geometrically with exactly one other component exactly one time, right? Then what we can do is we can take the unknotted component and the, uh, the linked component, both of them, we can completely separate them from the link, um, and then we can cancel them. We just get rid of them. All right, so let's do this example. So I have this link of three components here. So this unnatty guy is going to be our, um, our L0. And this is going to be our L1. And the first thing I'm going to do is kind of redraw this a little bit, uh, a little bit nicer. So, uh, this. I don't know if it's nice and big like this. The point was kind of weird, but that's fine. I'm actually going to put the zero component in here. And this guy will just be out here, just doing this thing. We'll see this was minus three. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, we're going to slide the the this plus one guy, this guy here. We're going to slide this guy over the unknotted component. So first of all, when we slide over the unknotted component, because it's zero framed, uh, what it means is that the the sort of the guy that you want to uh, slide it to uh, is what you can slide it to, right? It means that uh, actually I should just do this zoomed in. So we have the unknotted component, and we have the guy that we're sliding. And this guy slides exactly to uh, just the opposite of this guy. And that's because it's zero frame. So then we get this guy over here by itself, completely separated. And we get these two guys left over. And so far, none of the framings will change, right? And you can verify that using the, uh, the formula that we did for handle slides. OK. So now what happens? Let's take a look at. This picture. So again, we get uh, we get this guy again. I'm just gonna draw it over here. It's just hanging out. Yeah. And what we can do with uh, with what remains is we can use this. Uh, we can use a handle slide to sort of undo one of these crossings. like this. So we're going to get a new knot, which sort of goes along here, goes behind, goes over here, 
and comes back like this. If you draw what that looks like, it does this thing. It sticks with this part, with this part. So this is still um, this is still zero frame. It's got inside, but they got outside. So now the the not to leak. So this framing will actually go down, and it'll go down by oh, up actually. And it'll go up by exactly uh, two. And if you look carefully at this picture, you will see that. L1, in this case, has now become unknotted. So I can just isotope this to be, you know, the guy, the trefoil guy out here still, and uh, just this picture. So we get a zero guy and a minus one guy, right? And then finally, you know, these two guys can be separated, right? And when I separate, I think this becomes plus one, this becomes uh, minus one. And this is just using the, uh, I mean, you can, you can do, think of it as a handle slide or you can even just think of it as a, a, a blow down like we did before. And these guys can just be deleted by K1 moves. So you know we get the same frame link, right? the same component and in the same framing. All right. So, so this is what this theorem is, this is what this uh, proposition is describing, is this sort of process. Uh, real quickly, let's talk about why we know this is true. Uh, so of course we can we can use the, uh, uh, the unknotted zero frame component to unlink and unknot L1, right? Without changing any of the other framings. And then we're going to be left with something that looks like this. We have something that's zero frame and something that's in frame. And then you can just use um, handle slides to decrease this coefficient to either, you know, this picture or this picture, whether it's, depending on whether it's even or odd. And then both of these can, can uh, end up being canceled. All right. All right, so those are going to be the curvy wounds that we uh, uh, that we have in the in, in this section. There's definitely more curvy moves uh, and you can under curvy moves, but there's more definitely more things you can do with curvy calculus. Uh, if you want to see some some more things you can do, uh, I refer you to uh, the Gump and Stiftrix's book. And they have a, a whole section on curvy calculus where they go through all sorts of stuff like this. All right, so any question on the, on the, on the curvy calculus stuff? Uh, can we also see plus and minus, uh, like, uh, if you look at the first move, plus and minus one surgery on an unknot is S3, right? 
Yeah, so can we right. also see it sort of like connects some of S3 and so it just doesn't change them? Yeah, yeah, that works too. Okay, thank you. All right, for the rest of the time, we want to start getting ready to talk about four manifolds and sort of linking up this uh, surgery description stuff with the actual four manifold uh, topology. And to do that, I want to start by doing a quick review of some handle decomposition stuff. All right. So first, we're going to start by defining what an arbitrary handle. Uh, if I have an n-dimensional handle of index k, well, this is just a, uh, it's really a n ball, but sort of look viewed as a dk uh, cos dn minus k, uh, attached along the boundary of the dk part. So the whole idea behind these handle decompositions is sort of uh, creating a sort of manifold, uh, a manifold analog of doing sort of CW complexes, where you start off with zero cells and then add one cells and then add two cells and so forth and so on. You're going to do a similar thing except with like thicket zero cells and thicket one cells and thicket two cells. That's exactly what we're going to do. All right. So let's do a few uh, definitions. Uh, so the attaching region is, you know, the boundary of the dk across the dn minus k. So in this picture, this three-dimensional one handle, uh, it's going to be these two circles at the bottom. And this is what we actually use to attach, right? This is going to attach to the manifold. A few other things you might want to know is the core. It's the guy that goes right through the middle of the handle, like this. The co-core is sort of the, uh, the transverse guy right here in the middle. The attaching sphere is just the endpoints of the core right here in this picture. But in general, it's just the boundary of the, uh, it's the, uh, the boundary of the core. And the belt sphere, finally, is the boundary of the co-core, like this. All right. So this attaching map H above we got to be able to, uh, we want to be able to understand how many different ways we can actually attach a handle to the boundary of a manifold. And this attaching map can actually be determined by two pieces of information. The, the first piece is an embedding of the, uh, the embedding of the attaching sphere into the boundary of the manifold and a framing, which is just the identification of the normal bonding Novel bundle of the attaching sphere with the, uh, with like, uh, well, yeah, it's a choice of a normal bundle of the attaching sphere. I should say that, yeah. With this, we can define what a handle decomposition is. So if you're given a manifold, uh, which is obtained just by gluing handles together, uh, and note here that zero handles, the attaching region of a zero handle is always empty. So you can always just, you know, in, invoke zero handles into existence. Uh, so if you get a manifold just by attaching handles, uh, this is called a handle decomposition of that manifold. And every smooth compact manifold has a handle decomposition. And that follows from Morse theory. Also, 
uh, a neat fact is that the order in which you attach handles can always be done in order of increasing index. So you can always start with the zero handles and then attach the one handles, then attach two handles, so forth and so on. And also handles of the same index can be attached in any order. And so why is this last guy the case? See if we can prove this. So let's say I have two handles. Uh, I call this HI. which be handles of index, and I've just denoted ki. These are two handles. And we're also gonna suppose that, uh, k2 is less than or equal to k1. So k, so k1 is a, is a larger index handle. And suppose we attach you know, H1 and H2 to the boundary of some manifold uh, in this exact order, right? We catch K1, uh, H1 first and then H2. So this basically falls from just saying two statements. The first statement is that uh, if If the attachment region of H2 is disjoint from H1, right, then it sort of means that they're not really interacting with each other when they're being glued together. Um, then the order can be swapped. Right? So if they're not really interacting with each other at all, then we don't really matter which one came first, right? But since the dimension of the attaching sphere of H2 is with this K2 minus 1. And we have that the dimension of the belt sphere of H1 is n minus k1 minus 1. Then we have that, you know, n plus k2 minus k1 minus 2 is less than n. So what it means is that uh, the attaching region for uh, H2 can always be made dis disjoint to H1. And so here's a nice, here's a, here's a picture. So let's say I had, I'm gonna draw this a dimension down because you know, maybe you can kind of see what's going on. So let's say I had, let's say I had a, a three manifold, you know, picture, but really thinking of this like a, as any dimension. And let's think of a, uh, and let's say I think of a, a two handle that I'm blowing on like this. So the two handles glued along this sort of sphere here, right? And perhaps I had a one handle that I glued onto the top of the two handle somewhere, right? Well, the, re the, the point is, is that since this boundary region that this two handle, uh, of this two handle is a, is a disc, and this attaching region right here is, is kind of a disc too, I can always just isotope this away, right? Basically, they're just too small of dimension to, to really, to, to, to restrict your freedom, right? You can always sort of isotope them away from each other. 
And that's the idea of why you can always swap. You can always make it disjoint, and then you can always swap. Same is always true if they're the same index, by the way. So since we care about uh, four manifolds, we're going to focus on the four-dimensional case. So we're going to assume that M is uh, a compact connected orientable smooth four manifold. All the nice adjectives that we like to have, right? And we're going to talk about what a comp, uh, uh, what a handle decomposition of M would look like. So first of all, we can start with zero handles. Uh, and again, like I said, these are you know they're attached by the empty set which means we can just invoke them into existence. And we always only ever need uh, at most one, right? We really only ever just need one. And the reason why is because if it had two zero handles, then the, the only way this can be connected is if they're attached by a one handle. And once we attach the one handle, then we basically just have, you know, and in, uh, a four ball again. That's the idea. So let's look at one handles. These are attached by uh, two, three balls on the boundary of the of the manifold we're gluing on. So if we picture this sort of open space in the screen as you know the boundary of our manifold, some space, you know, where you know this sort of looks like X3 locally, right? Or R R R3 locally, I should say. Then basically the attachment region are just these two uh, spheres like this, right? And we can think of gluing on this one handle as just identifying the uh, the region inside these two spheres, right? Uh, actually, I'll draw a picture this way. So this, even though this is not, you know, an accurate representation, let's assume this is our D1 cross D3, we just identify the endpoints uh, with these two spheres somehow. Now, in general, there are two framings. Uh, for attaching a one handle. We have one that uh, doesn't affect orientability. And we have uh, one that always yields a non orientable uh, manifold. And since our focus in this course is on orientable manifolds, we, we're only going to be ever thinking things of, uh, they have one handles attached this way. Now, two handles, which are the most exciting, is that G2 cross D2s. We are attached by, turns out, are just frame knots, right? What do we need to attach a two handle? Well, we need an embedding of the attaching sphere, which is just a knot. Let's say it looks something like this. 
and we need a framing, which we already know how those work. So let's say this is like minus five. So this is how we can draw attaching a two handle. If I already had one handles in the picture, you know, I could also attach a two handle, say, uh, like this. You can run these over one handles, stuff like this. And they give it some frame if we And then finally we have the three and four handles. Uh, because we're not looking at four four and folds that are too complicated, I'm not gonna think about these too much. Uh, and the reason why is because if we think of if we let M2 just denote the union of just the zero, one, and two handles. And there is a unique way to obtain a closed four manifold just by adding three and four handles. Um, and because of that, we don't really keep track of three and four handles when we're thinking about closed four manifolds. Um, also, I just want to point out that you always only need at most one four handle. And we're going to talk a little more in depth about uh, what this thing, what, what thinking about our four, uh, four manifolds this way gives us uh, in the next lecture. But I think I want to call that it for today. Are there any questions? Is there a way to like see where the three handles are in this picture? So, well, in this picture, not really, uh, but to, to sort of see how it, it, it works, to see why this is true. I guess it's a little bit why this is true. Um, it comes down to the fact that if you have a closed manifold, well, the battery of M2 is just going to be the battery of a, in, uh, a four dimensional handle body. So if you imagine what the picture looks like uh, dimension down, you know, it's, it's got to be the boundary of some guy that looks like this of a dimension up. And, you know, attaching these handles are going to be something equivalent to, to what, like, attaching these things onto the boundary and then filling in with a, with a four handle. It's kind of the idea of what these will look like. I think I can give you a better idea of what's going on. I think so.